Hello, everybody. Um, here we are back to classes again, and uh, we're going online. And we're going to um, just to kind of quickly tell you, your big project is to um, work on that final project. And I'm going to have a few poetry assignments kind of interspersed over the next few weeks. And so I thought today that I would um, give you a little um, kind of introduction to poetry and how to approach poetry. Uh, we're going to take a very simple approach. We're not going to be picking a poem apart by its meter or being able to identify what type of poem it is. We're going to mostly just be looking at the content and how to make sense of the content and how to approach uh, reading a poem. And that's kind of what I want to talk about today. So um, I'll post this list in um, the assignments, but they'll also you'll be able to watch this video. So there's a few things here that I think that if you just kind of relax and go with the poem, uh, you're going to be okay. So I, th I think the first thing is just read the poem through once with no expectations. Just read it. Just kind of get a sense of maybe a little bit of what's going on. Uh, you know, most poems have actual people in them. And who are those people? What are they doing? What are they saying? Why are they saying what they're saying? those kind of things. Just kind of read it and give it a little thought. You might want to read the poem out loud once. Um, it Poems are meant to be heard and, um, you know, oftentimes that's a good way to understand a little better. A lot of the poems that I'm going to post are also going to have an audio version. So if you click the red arrow in the red circle next to the title, you can read along. Um, let me move, get me out of the way here read along and listen at the same time. You might find this to be a very useful strategy. Um, you know, the different things work for different people. So I'm just trying to give you some ways to approach, just initially approach a poem before you start kind of digging in. Don't look for hidden meaning. We've talked about that before. Let's include don't read between the lines because there's nothing there. You might actually want to look up words you don't know. It could be very important a poem. Because the thing that really distinguishes a poem from longer pieces of rising, writing is it's so compact. So, so one or two words can be very important because they have a lot of connotations or they might suggest other ideas. So, so the words become a little more intense and you have to pay a little more attention to them in a poem because you don't have a whole paragraph to explain an idea. A poet might be trying to just capture that idea by a word that suggests other ideas. Uh, I'm not going to get into a lot of the sort of elements of poetry. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with metaphor, simile. Uh, juxtaposition is another thing. It, it's this kind of the same thing. It's comparing things. Um, so, um, you know, if somebody says, well, you know, our love is like a red, red rose. Well, a rose is symbolic and you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and, and most of the symbols, and it does use symbolism just like it does in literature, you know, are, are the same kind of symbols. Uh, they're actually pretty conventional. Uh, you know, again, listen to the poem. And then after you've kind of done engaging the poem kind of on this first level, there's some questions you could ask yourself and try to answer is, who's the speaker? Do not assume the speaker is the poet. The poet usually creates some kind of persona or like a character. Uh, it's not necessarily the poet. Um, Emily Dickinson um, says that, uh, has a nice poem you've heard of Emily Dickinson called, um, um, geez, no, I can't think of it. Um, I dwell in possibilities. Okay, so poets look at possibilities. Um, they may explore certain topics like five different ways. So I just mentioned Emily Dickinson. One of the poems you're going to read is Because I Couldn't Stop for Death, It Kindly Stopped for Me. And it kind of deals with the idea of how we think about death and eternity and if death is a scary thing or not so scary. Um, yet she gives another poem called I Heard a Fly Buzz When I Died that suggests there's no eternity. When you die, that's it. Lights out and it uses a fly as kind of a creepy image. Um, what are the circumstances that give rise to the poem? So what's going on? What happened? Why would somebody even write a poem about this? What's the situation? 
you're going to read a poem called um, The Ruined Maid. And it's these two young ladies who run into each other in this town and they're talking about one of the young ladies' situations. Uh, what's, what is the situation? What, and because the one girl keeps referring to herself is that she's ruined. Well, what does ruined mean? And why, why is she ruined? Uh, who or what is the audience? Who's this intended to, to, to be aimed at? Okay, sometimes in poems, there's tone. You know, we talked about hills like white elephants where it kind of had that sarcastic tone. So sometimes poems kind of have a tone. And it's, uh, again, um, the, uh, the, the poem, The Ruined Maid, has a very specific tone. Um, the, the, the girl that lives in the town um, has this kind of uh, almost sarcastic tone about her situation. Uh, Sometimes poems are tied to some historical, specific historical moment. Um, I don't know if we're going to read any of those, but um, there'll be mentions of them. And, I'm, and we're going to look at a poem when we get done with this. Uh, does a poem speak from a specific culture? Would a, was it, would a poem that comes from a Hispanic culture, or Asian culture, be quite different to us or have different ideas? Does a poem have its own vernacular? So you're probably wondering what vernacular means. Uh, that would be like the local speech patterns, uh, more of a simple, common kind of speech, or a kind of speech like, for example, where I'm from, we don't call a shopping cart a buggy. Here you call it a buggy. That would be vernacular, OK? Uh, the main thing, and I'm going to talk a lot about this when we look at a poem, is does the poem use imagery to achieve a particular effect? And I, I think if you kind of really focus on imagery, um, that can reveal a lot to you about the poem and help you understand it better. And when we talk about imagery, we can talk about that definitely in a visual sense, but we can also talk about it in a kind of just a, a, in, in, in terms of senses, how things smell, how things taste, what they feel like when we touch them. Um, um, what's it sound like? Um, did I say what's it smell like? All of those kind of things are, are ways that poems use imagery to kind of convey ideas. And it's also through emotion, and, and a lot of imagery expresses emotion, so pay attention to that. Uh, what kind of figurative language? This is kind of repetitive. That's that sort of metaphor, simile kind of thing. Well, we'll talk about maybe illusion in one poem. Illusion means kind of referencing some other literary piece in the piece that we're looking at. Um, one, one of the things that, that might you, you might find really helpful is if a poem is a question or is asking a question, what's the answer? We're going to look at two poems later on, one called The Tiger, one called The Lamb, and both of those are based on a question. And it's is it's really is there an answer does one answer a question and one not if the poem is an answer what's the question now it's important to pay attention to uh titles too what does the title suggest and the last one would be does a poem use unusual words in an unusual way so what i want you to be able to do is to kind of just ask yourself these kind of critical questions uh, I'm not looking for a lot of right or wrong answers here. I'm just looking for, you know, well, um, well supported answers. And uh, we can do that through textual evidence, uh, which should probably be the main one for this. Uh, I, I'm not necessarily opposed to you if you went to Spark Notes or something like that to kind of get some idea of what's going on in a poem. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to just try to get through this semester as best we can. So uh, basically, we'll kind of approach the poetry as some discussion board assignments. We'll have two or three. I can't see us having any more than three. So um, what I want to do now is, since this is kind of fresh, uh, let me pull up a, a poem. If I can get to it, I don't want that. Uh-oh. Now I lost everything. All right, let me uh, figure out what I did. Go to Word. Then 
people here, just hang with me. <clears throat> okay, so here's a poem, and I want to kind of walk you guys through it, okay? It's a poem by an African-American poet, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, who's writing in the 1890s, I believe. So this is from the 19th century. Uh, the name of the poem is called Sympathy. Um, now, the first line of this is, I know what the cage bird feels. Now, you've probably heard of um, Maya Angelou, and one of her famous works was I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which was written way after this poem was. Now, this is a pretty good example of the idea of illusion. An illusion is A-L-L-U-S-I-O-N. You know, it's like something alludes to something else. So in Maya Angelou's work, in that title of that work, she's alluding to uh, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's very famous poem, Sympathy. So the first thing that I would look at with this poem is, okay, it's in three parts, okay? You can almost think of stanzas as kind of paragraphs, okay? And these paragraphs have a different idea, but they're all kind of unified to, to, to have one idea, okay? Almost like come to some kind of thesis statement on this. So if we look at this, and, and this, is a, this, this poem relies a lot on imagery and, and words that kind of convey emotions, okay? So it starts out, I know what the cage bird feels, alas, when the sun is bright on the upland slopes, when the wind stirs soft through the springing grass and the river flows like a stream of glass, when the first bird sings and the first bud opes and the faint perfume from its chalice steals, I know what the cage bird feels. Okay, so the dominant kind of idea here is uh, I know what the cage bird feels. Now, if we think about that in terms of the title, isn't that what sympathy is? We know how somebody else feels. We can kind of feel what they feel. And he's saying as a man in the 1890s, as a black man, he knows what the cage bird feels. Now, so we have this imagery here, and it's actually pretty nice. It's, it's beautiful springtime, kind of a meadow. The sun is bright, the wind stirs soft, springing grass, stream of glass. This river flows like a stream of glass. Buds are opening, the first bird sings. Uh, the faint perfume from the chalice steals. That's from the, I, from the uh, flower. I know what the cage bird feels. So this is actually kind of nice. Uh, one of the terms we would use to kind of describe this um, uh, uh, type of writing here is it's called pastoral. It's P-A-S. Let me see if I can do this. Pastoral. So pastoral means um, like a pasture, like very organic, very natural, very kind of tied to nature, okay? So he's, 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 there's this cage bird, but he's sitting in his cage looking out, and he's seeing all this great stuff out in front of him, you know, this, this beautiful landscape, okay? Um, but he knows what the cage bird feels because the cage bird really doesn't have access to this really good stuff, okay? So... Let's go to the second stanza, all right? Now, we wanna really kind of pay attention because this one's really different from the first one in tone, in imagery, in, in, in all of those kind of things we've talked a little bit about. I know why the cage bird beats his wing till its blood is red on the cruel bars for he must fly back to his perch and cling when he fain would be on a bough a swing and pain still throbs in the old, old scars and they pulse again with a keener sting I know why he beats his wing. So if you ask yourself, how is this stanza really different from the one we just read? Well, well let's take a look at it. Okay, so the cage bird beats his wing. Blood is red on cruel bars. He has to fly back to his perch and cling. The pain still throbs in the old, old scars, and they pulse again with even a keener or stronger sting. 
when he's sitting in this cage looking outside at all this stuff that's really good that he doesn't have any access to, that he, he doesn't have. And the idea is, is well, he, why can't he have it? Well, because he's a black man in 1890s. You know, he, his life is pretty limited. So if you had to kind of think of a word to sort of describe the tone and the language used, I mean, the word that kind of comes to, to mind for me is pretty violent. Okay, which when you compare it to this first stanza, it, it's quite different. Okay, so now, you know, think about this and the pain still throbs in the old, old scars. What is he talking about there? Well, this is a man writing a poem in 1890. How far removed is he from slavery? Now, not very far. And what do we know that happened to a lot of slaves? They got beat, they got whipped, left deep scars. So, so he's saying, even though slavery's over, that, that pain is still alive because even though they're free, they're still you know, not included. They're excluded from very, very, very many things and they can still be treated very violently, okay? That, so hopefully that kind of makes sense, okay? Now, if we go to this last stanza, I know why the, this one is going to be a little different, okay? But you notice everything starts with the caged bird and ends with caged bird here, okay? I know why the caged bird sings, ah me, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore. When he beats his bars and he would be free, it's not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core. But a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know why the caged bird sings. Now, this stanza is quite a bit different from the other ones. Um, and he's he seems almost, I mean, the word that kind of comes to mind for me, he's just kind of um let's go resign. To the situation here but within this situation one has to kind of maintain some kind of hope because it's a really <coughs> excuse me really uh, kind of a hopeless situation and in a hopeless situation you know one thing we need to just kind of survive and want to get up in the next morning is some kind of hope and of course this hope comes from kind of a a religious point of view okay so um that 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 at some point you know by praying and, and and even through death when you're finally really free that that that's what gives this this guy hope and hope that sometimes that some in some time that this whole situation is going to change so we have kind of religious imagery here we have um let's see yeah we have the kind of religious imagery here this idea of being resigned to the situation but needing hope uh this kind of violence and reference to slavery and this is all the kind of stuff that if i had to kind of really think about it is is a black person in this era and in this place this this sort of stuff this kind of situation or this 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 scenario is denied him that um um african americans are excluded from this kind of thing so um i'm, I'm just kind of using this video is to kind of give you a way to approach uh, poetry don't get too wound up about it I'm not looking at, you know whether you're right or wrong I'm looking that you give it a good shot and, and give it some thought so um, I'll be posting this video and well I am posting this video um, so um, what I'd like to say just right now is let's get through this semester as best we can make your main focus on that final project and um, hopefully we'll resume classes in a real classroom, but I can tell you right now, it's probably not gonna be till fall.